for producers. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much to Karen and to Robin for sharing the thoughts. Um, the intention of today is to engage everybody in a dialogue. So what we'd like to do is from each presentation to ask David some key questions together that may have already been prompted by Karen and Robin around how we manifest the rocks of daily, you know, how we are in relationship with others in order to make a difference, how we can show this for the public good, whatever our questions. But what we'll do at the break time is to write some up for you then to decide which group you want to go into after the third <coughs> presentation, um, which is after tea and cookies. So cookies being the important part of that phrase. So um, it's my pleasure to say thank you and to move into the next conversation um, with uh, two um, wonderful people who have worked with Kabakai for a long time, but also both work as artists in Kabakai, but also work without Kabakai in other contexts, but drawing on the um, creative learning community that we are all part of. So Helen Jury is an artist and art psychotherapist um, and researcher and lecturer and many different hats. Um, and Catherine Mont Robinson is um, an artist and researcher and also working with um, GPs in Bristol and care homes and etc. So uh, we're, we're part of um, a team of people really that are trying to make these issues more visible. I think what we'd like to do first of all is introduce ourselves so that you know exactly where we come from in terms of um, what Penny very nicely phrased as our within and without. So to show how we are within and without, Catherine. <laughs> very good. Um, so, yes, Michael, I thought to, what, what's the point of doing it? That's, that's okay. It's interesting, we should do it that way or that way. You can take it to the back. It's actually quite clear when you were speaking. So if I can start. So I can be an integrating force, in my opinion, it can be an integrating force which is not an add-on or a plaster, it's where, it's where I come from as, a, as an individual. Um, so everything that I do, whether I'm with, as I was with, uh, you know, professors and GPs yesterday, fiddling about with bits of material, or working in a nursery school, or working with patients, or being in a special needs school, actually I would say the ingredients are pretty well the same. And I am driven to work in ways which help people to maybe expand into their own interests, personalities, not just emotions, thoughts. It's, it's the whole process. So that's where I come from as an individual. That I, I feel that I gain greatly from all the different settings that I bring to from the children, the adults, or people, patients, and disabled workshops. And interestingly, Catherine and I cross over um, in a number of areas, which is why we've chosen to speak together today. Um, and well-being is a very nice middle ground for us. Um, I think we share those absolute core values as artists first and foremost in terms of the work that we do. So we go back to those values very much so. And my training is also as an art psychotherapist, and so therefore I will work with other boundaries as well to work to keep somebody safe whilst we explore more complex material with the deliberation of looking at a more profound understanding of their well-being and 
perhaps also addressing issues of acute mental health. But uh, Catherine and I have worked um, on a number of, of different angles on, on the same projects. So we've actually um, worked together on workshops in terms of exploring how other people look at how they handle their own understanding of themselves through the art materials, great times of play. And also in terms of mentoring each other in um, settings in 5 by 5 by 5 and also working as artists within setting, both of us having worked um, within uh, learning disabilities. So we have a lot of um, common areas for working. And I think well-being is actually a very interesting point from which to start for us because it's at the core of what we understand we want to be trying to achieve when we're working in artistic practice with young people, adults, or even we were talking in our preparation for this discussion, we were looking at very, very early years, so thinking about infant observation and looking at the very first moments, as well as the end of life as well, two areas which perhaps aren't considered in the forefront of understanding well-being, especially you know, in terms of um, how apparently people are treated in some um, NHS hospitals at the end of their life, but also at the beginning. And actually you had a lovely example in terms of, of interaction. I wonder if you can share it. Okay. In terms of working with a baby and the beginning. Yeah, again, um, learning together, learning with our colleagues and, and learning from children and indeed parents uh, is, is key. And uh, I, I really can't remember the name of the condition that um, this very young uh, neurological condition that this very, very happy, uh, much loved child has. And uh, she was perhaps about one. And it comes back to what Penny was saying this, this morning about sometimes without the uh, training in psychology, um, being a mother and a human, it's getting, having that courage to to follow um, your gut instinct really in a sort of informed, empathetic way. I was I was watching the child, and I could just sense that there was a real sense of engagement with her, that she was making some sorts of connections, and I started bringing uh, different books and art materials around, and she picked up an old Bunty annual <laughs> that I had from when I was very young, and she was pointing at various images and then pointing over and she was actually looking at people who looked like other people in the room who she'd only just met and when I went <laughs> she was you know sort of, and this is, this is so young but I was just so excited that, that this child who's been given really a very terrifying diagnosis um, was meaning making so happily and I just felt so privileged that being involved in 5 by 5 we have been given the time and the space, the luxury, to go into settings and learn from the children, watch them, push our own boundaries in terms of our learning, talk to people who are the teaching assistants, the, the cleaners indeed, etc., and learn about the whole child, learn about the setting, and start to draw from that so that we can be more informed in whatever sort of so whatever spectacles we put on, we can start to put on lots of different spectacles. Sue was mentioning this this morning. And we make lots and lots of mistakes, but if we take the time, the children will, will give us the information. And, and one little anecdote, when um, there's an image that comes up here of a child that's looking through ice, and uh, when I was in a special needs uh, school in uh, Salisbury, I thought, that I was giving this child a lot of time and attention. And I thought that she was showing a lot of spirit and I was delighted. She only has um, a little bit of movement in one arm. She has to be completely supported down the back and she has very alert eyes and a smile. Um, and I thought as soon as I was trying to engage her in something and I sort of gave up that I would move away and as soon as I'd turn away, she, she would do something. And it was only afterwards that I realised that it took seven seconds for her to process that. Now, if someone had said to me that I only take seven seconds before I give up and do something else or go away, I wouldn't have believed them. Hmm. So it's that sort of, that's a sort of, if you like, a metaphor for engaging and, and thinking about, you know, we think we're giving quality time, we think we're engaging in different ways, and 
think back, yeah, ask questions, find out about condition, whatever. And that actually feeds in very nicely to something that we were talking about in terms of our practice. Certainly my practice as an outside therapist when I'm working clinically. I will go back and I'll look at case histories. I will actually sometimes choose to work, for example, with the parents rather than the child who has been referred in the understanding that actually the child can become the vehicle for the problem that's being manifested and actually thinking, well, what's going on for the parents? Where are they at in this? If we work with the parents first, actually the situation for the child is made better, it's ameliorated in some ways, and then we can work with the child. And I think the whole idea about engagement is obviously key to our practice anyhow. There'll be various sort of phrases coming up in terms of how we try to sort of pick out key ideas about what we see is that engagement as being and how it's actually that sort of another of um, the engagement. But also just taking it on from the earlier bit about saying about infant observation and also you know five by five by five is expanding its ideas. Why not look at the elderly as well? And just thinking about that disengagement towards the end of life, and this was something we were talking about in terms of well-being, and how that actually is perhaps paid enough attention to in society, and how we're losing a sense of how to disengage and to look at somebody's life as a whole. So if you can start at that very beginning and work with them in terms of engagement, look at how you can work with the disengagement as well, which was another thought that came to us. But um, one of the things we did come up with as well, I mean, you sit here and you think, okay, so how should we have this conversation? We've never been such a thing that's going to do that. So we say lots of different things. But we also came up with the phrase, what we're given as permission, we can give the children as permission. So there's something about looking at your own values and really getting back down to your real core values <coughs> and working with those and giving yourself permission to work with those. And there was talk in the group that we had this morning about being courageous. And we also use the word brazen. Now, brazen sounds as if it's a little bit cocky as well. And hence, you know, some discussion about risk and whatever. But actually, as artists, I believe we understand what risk is, and we are prepared to take it, and it's factored into our understanding of how we look at things. And so to trust that intuition, and to work with that, to work positively in the client group or the area that we're engaged in, and to work through the art materials and to get the best from people as well, and to actually look at their well-being. It's not about something that we want to achieve necessarily, and it's not about us ticking boxes. It's about saying that we want to understand where the core of their well-being is as well. I'd like to bring in an example of um, some patient work in a GP surgery that I um, am involved in in Bristol. And you will have seen uh, an image of uh, glasses that are drawn around them, the lollipop sticks that are drawn around, etc. there. And this is really just a sort of follow-up from what Helen has just said. Am I speaking loud enough? I'm probably a little bit. Um, that idea of starting where you're at, and whether it's a child or, uh, in this case, a 65-year-old gentleman, um, feeling safe. Don't know why he decided he would come to a creative arts workshop. I reckon he just trusted the referral from the GP. Um, because he came in saying, not interested in art, don't like art, can't do art, but smiling. <laughs> However, he started off by drawing around his glasses and things that were on the table, and as Helen would say and did say, that was where he was at, when she saw the image, you know, the idea of securing himself, that was fine. By the end of the six, seven, eight weeks maybe, um, he had started to reveal that he was a, a passionate about the fallen in war, shall I say, and all the lost youths in war. And he came in with a straw so that in the session that he could actually blow a poppy out of paint, and then you will see that image of red splodges, <laughs> and, and, called, and called it, um, you know, resurrection, or sorry, uh, I can't remember the name, for fallen youths anyway, at the top. You know. So to me, for someone who came in and was very nervous of materials, to think and work his way through presenting something from his breath was really, I'm not saying it's a move forward, but it was a big move you know, to actually encompass, if you like, the creative process and his values 
to be in that way. And as we were also saying this morning, the person who can seem to be the most resistant in the group can sometimes be the person who manifests the greatest catalyst within the group. So whereas he came in the most resistant, the rest of the group were caught up by the fact that he was pushing his own boundaries and following what was to him his creative process. And that was a very inspirational thought. And I think you know, this goes back to the idea of risk taking. And we wrote down some ideas about risk taking because I think you know, risk is sometimes a very sort of uncomfortable thing to be with. And we wanted to think about how uncomfortable it can be to take a risk, to do something where you don't know where the result is going to lead you. And very much in, in both um, the ways that we practice, either as um, an artist with arts and health projects or as an artist or as an arts and health therapist, we actually look at taking risk and going with the intuition of what we do. And also how we respond to risk. And we're not talking about risk in terms of obviously somebody's safety, but we're talking about risk in terms of practice, in pushing it out just that little bit more, in about finding out what suits that person at that time, and just thinking how that encouraged that elderly man to take his own risk and to actually try out things which he may not have felt very comfortable with at all. But also how, you know, certainly from my practice and also from Catherine's. Um, working with the non-verbal and how that is really hugely important to be able to work with somebody to understand what their language may be and to work with the risk of that for them because sometimes it's not possible to actually say what it is you want to say and therefore the risk is in actually embodying it in your work in the artwork so working with somebody that they can manifest that in the artwork can be quite a difficult and perhaps a bit of a painful process as well for them so working with that risk. Um, and actually, when we were in discussion, we ended up talking about Ralph Stephan as well. I don't know whether any of you are aware that there's an exhibition that's just come on about the extinct birds. Um, lots of people have been asked to represent mm -hmm. extinct birds. And, um, and Ralph Stephan was asked to represent one of the cartoonists. And, uh, and he said he was sitting there one night chatting to this man who sort of out this exhibition, and this man was sort of saying, Oh, it's terrible late at night that you get on the telly. You know, it's all this needless smut. And Ralph Stephan said, yes, needless smut. It's excellent. And by six o'clock the following morning, apparently there was an email with an attachment sent back to the producer or whoever was managing this exhibition of the needless smut. And this was his extinct bird, which is... <laughs> <laughs> um, and what he was saying, uh, which I think, you know, that's a lovely little anecdote in itself, but he was talking about how his practice worked. And if you think about risk, risk is sometimes something you take and nobody else would, but feels very safe for you. And he said, but people said, why are there so many blots in your work? Why is it so untidy? And he said, well, what we do is I take the paintbrush, put it in the room, I'll slap it on the page. And he said, from that point, I actually find something in there. Now, in terms of risk, you know, nobody's going to be in danger by that. But what he's doing is saying, is saying, actually, I know I can find myself out of that unknown. And going with the unknown is the most exciting part of it. So in our practice, whichever level of discipline we're talking about, in terms of finding somebody's way through to well-being, I think that's quite important, and keeping that in mind. And you'll notice in um, one of the slides, there's what looks like a sort of messy arrangement in the woods. The woods are actually, thanks to Laura, up here, and um, working with three ways school and learning disabilities, we brought the kids out into the woods. And if you've ever tried getting a wheelchair through the mud, <coughs> you, it's pretty hard work. So there was a risk assessment, we got a wheelchair through the mud. And we took them up into the woods, and they created whatever it was they wanted in the woods using the materials. Now, there's nothing that looks like nothing that looks like nothing. So there's no artwork. But actually what they did was have a time that allowed them to find their ways of communication, their ways of talking, and their sense of well-being. And they went back into school with different languages between them and with the environment that wasn't evidence anywhere else. How do you put that into statistics? We were talking about that earlier. That's a different section. Mm. Yes, I mean, we're very conscious of the fact that we want to try and 
in groups of pin our ideals and values and five by five values just to some sort of practical hooks and it, it's not that easy really. So thank you for that, Helen. But it's you know, how do you actually set up a situation where you are feeling anxious that the feeling that a, let's say the child is looking through the glass as I remember, sorry, the ice as I remember something else. How do you persuade the, the teachers and teaching assistants that it that it's safe and it's not going to hurt her to try something different when you're not very confident about yourself and you're not a physical therapist. So there's all this negotiation and trust. Um, but in the end, it is the relational aspect that I think that wins through if you are given the, the support to be in the setting and, and win the trust because you genuinely and authentically want to understand the children, understand what's going on. So again, a very practical example here. That girl who just had the, the little bit of movement and grip in one arm, um, we managed to lie her on a wedge so, uh, so that she was supported and had a white sheet of paper mm -hmm. and a, a wet uh, roll of uh, clay so that she could just make a mark across it. And that was so exciting to her. Now, this wasn't something that came to me like that. <laughs> it took me a long time to do it. It took me a long time to build up the courage to ask about it. I was in fear about it because the physiotherapist was nearby, you know. Everybody was watching, you know. And was it worth all the effort, you know. Um, and, and, you know, that set a tone then of us all together, trying things out, you know. Another child that you put a stretchy sock near who had very little strength, but just the fact that he was able to make that resistant movement, he really enjoyed that feeling and then he wanted to take it more. So, again, the observation of that interest in him, some children wouldn't be, you know, observation of that interest and being allowed to let it be. Absolutely, and also not having outcomes, not having expectations, going with where the child happens to be at the time. And you'll notice there are, obviously, the children we're working with did not make that lovely ice glow. That's an added on to the And the fish, the ceramic fish that you see coming through as well, is Miguel Bartolo, so that's not made by the children. But I took these books in because we were going to be working with certain materials, and I wanted them to have a look before they went and felt different materials, rubbing around in the earth, whatever. It was pretty cold sometimes when we went out as well. I think there was some ice around. And, uh, and just to understand, on their own personal level, what they might be able to be in contact with. And the boy who you see crouching over the book, that's one of several photos, he was absolutely entranced by the images. Because he was non-verbal, and because he had various other um, learning disabilities, I've no idea what he made from any of that. But if his attention was there, and it focused his pathway of thinking to an understanding that when he was outside in the environment, he could inform his work there, that was enough. Okay, I'm just wondering about the time. Yeah. I just wonder if we ought to open it out to people, if you have any comments or any questions that you'd like to ask us about anything. Um, I'm just wondering, um, as a psychotherapist, do you think that if you introduce this into um, the next stage of education, so um, secondary school, high school, um, myself and my colleagues are working in the next school for dyslexia and autism, and um, we're thinking in the long term, round up slowly, getting everyone on site to set up a room 13 model um, because we're both being physically involved. But something that dawned on me in my last post was when you have that, that conversation with children through making, through with young people, there opens up potentially the whole room for psycho um, psychoanalysis and potential vulnerable problems that difficulty is. And that called on me in my last post. And do you think that you can do that as an artist educator without having that skill base? Because that's something that I'm very aware of now, two years after that post. Yeah. 
I'm wondering how you feel about that. Okay, and I think my answer comes in three parts, actually. My first part is, is to respond to the school's understanding of what the objectives are in setting up that room, and therefore an understanding that if a child discloses, there has to be a clear pathway through to taking that child on to somewhere else, and that might well be one of the art psychotherapists, and that's a clear understanding, and there's training in place for the staff. In terms of an artist coming in and working creatively with the children, mm -hmm. I think where you have empathy and understanding and there are boundaries within the school that have to work effectively, an artist will take those on board if professionally they're sound in the way that they practice. And also I think you know, what's evident in terms of the 5 by 5 work is that there's that sort of empathy there and working with the staff and management the whole time. So you have that interrelational dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, the third Thing that I was going to say is I think it's quite interesting because um, I actually also work, as well as working on an MA art psychotherapy, I also teach on a, a BA course, which is working with students with therapeutic boundaries, so they're working their arts practice, but understanding that you need some boundaries around your work. And I think that's very much where we end up going towards as artists who are interested in mental health and in disabilities, you go towards finding what those boundaries are and some posting out to other areas of interest and other areas of necessity in terms of the child's particular needs. Yeah. Is anybody else want to ask me? Um, you talked about observation and the importance of observation. How do you hone those observational skills? Mm -hmm. That's a lovely question. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Very important question. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And may I just say, as we're about to pick up, interestingly, the culture has shifted in a way that I am doing as an artist um, more and more to come in and work with uh, uh, staff in settings to support that. Yeah. So, okay, so that's brilliant because we've ended on the first question. So, thank you very much. Um,